All right, let's look at this fascinating problem, which asks if f is a function that maps the reals to the reals and is continuous and satisfies that f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y for rational numbers x and y, then f of x must be a constant times x for some fixed constant c, regardless of what x is. So in other words, all the functions that satisfy this for rational values of x that are also continuous are actually themselves linear functions with no constant term. All right, so let's play around and see why this might be the case. First, let's do some evaluation at zero. So you notice that if we plug in zero for x and zero for y, we'll get that f of zero is itself f of zero plus f of zero. So if we subtract f of zero on both sides, we'll get that f of zero is itself zero. Okay, great. Now, if we actually plugged in y equals x here, we'd get f of x plus x, which is f of 2x, is equal to f of x plus f of x, which is 2f of x. So f of 2x is 2f of x. And we can do the same thing for any n that is an integer. So if we plugged in f of n, that's the same as f of 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, etc., where we have n copies of 1. And that's going to be n times f of 1 by the same inductive logic. So we get this consequence for any positive integer n. Now it states here this is true for all integers, but it's actually only true for positive integers. So we need to take a look at what happens with negative integers. Okay, if negative m is an integer, that's a negative integer, then m itself is a positive integer. So if we look at the actual instructions for our function, we'll have f of negative m plus f of m is equal to f of negative m plus m. Negative m plus m is zero, so this means we get f of zero, which we earlier computed is actually zero. So f of negative m is actually the negative of f of m. But we know what f of m is. So using the fact here that f of negative m is a negative f of m, and since m is a positive integer, we know that f of m is m times f of 1. We get that f of negative m is negative m times f of 1. So if we piece things together then, we already proved this equality that f of any number is that number times f of 1. When that number is a positive integer, now we have the same case for negative integers right over here. And so we have this equality regardless of what integer we select. And now we're going to be able to use this to actually figure out something about plugging in rational numbers. So let's say we take a rational number q and write it as p over r, where now p and r are themselves integers. Then again, using our property that f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y, if we look at r copies of f of p of r, p of r is the thing we're trying to actually compute the value of when we plug it into f. We'll assume r here is a positive integer. If this fraction is negative, we can make p a negative natural number and r a positive natural number. Or make p a non-negative one if q happens to be zero, but we don't have to worry about q being zero because we handled that case already. So now, r copies of f of p of r by applying this thing, r times, using the fact that r is a positive integer, that's going to be f of r times p of r. But now, r times p of r is actually p itself, and we know p is an integer. So f of p is, by what we proved earlier, equal to exactly p times f of 1. But now if we rearrange this, we notice that f of p over r is going to equal p over r times f of 1 by dividing by r here. So we get the same phenomenon we had for integers happening for rational numbers. If you plug in any rational number q into here, you'll get q times f of 1. Now let's look at the problem we were actually asked to figure out and see how much progress we've made. So we figured out that f of q is q times f of 1 for any rational number q. 
If we look back, what we wanted to prove is that f of x is equal to some constant times x for all x. Now, given what we have here, it looks like the constant that we need to pick is f of 1, right? f of q happens to be q times f of 1 for any q. And f of 1 is actually a constant. This is some function that we don't know. And when we plug in 1, we get an actual number. The problem is we want to actually prove this regardless of what x we select in the real numbers, right? And here we've only proven it for rational numbers. So really the thing that we haven't used about this function is the continuity, and that's what's left to get the rest of the argument. So let's remember that the rational numbers are actually dense in the reals. What that means is between any two real numbers, there's a rational number. And so if we have a real number, we can always find a sequence of rational numbers that converges to it. There's another way to see this. If you pick an arbitrary real number, you can write its decimal expansion, and that decimal expansion might go on forever. So if you take truncations, like up to the first decimal place, the second, the third, etc., 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 that's going to give you a sequence of rational numbers because each one is a truncated decimal, which means it's an actual rational number, and that sequence is going to converge to the number x itself. So why does that help us? Why does that help to have a sequence of rational numbers that converges to a given real number x. Well, since f of q is c times q for any rational number, if we take a sequence of rational numbers converging to a particular real number x, we know that when we evaluate each of these rational numbers under f, we'll get c times that given rational number. And so we'll notice that if we take the limit as n approaches infinity of f of qn, that is equal to the limit of these values as n approaches infinity. But the sequence q of n is approaching x. So that means this thing converges to c times this limit, which is c times the actual x that the individual qns are converging to. However, at the same time, we know that the sequence f of qn as n goes to infinity converges to f of the limit of the sequence we're inputting into the function. And this sequence converges to x. So this sequence of points f of qn is going to converge to f of x. Okay, so if we put that all together, knowing that f of qn actually converges to cx, we get that f of x is equal to cx for this arbitrary real number x. And so the value c being f of 1 actually gives us that f of x is cx for all x. So I think this is a really cool problem because you get something interesting on the rationals, but continuity actually lets you extend the linear behavior on the rationals to a linear behavior on all of the real numbers. So we see the only continuous solutions for this functional equations are linear functions that go through the origin. That's what a function like this looks like because it has no plus b term and it's just a constant function with a particular slope. Now you might ask the question, what happens if we drop the continuity condition here? Well, it turns out without the continuity assumption, there's many pathological solutions that exist that can be quite complicated to describe. But continuity completely rules all of them out. So a really interesting question that combines additivity with continuity to force you to have functions that are linear.